Thank you for the introduction and thank you to the selection committee for giving me this opportunity to present a progress report on the FFPE pilot study that we have done through TCGA. Um, for the talk today, I will cover um, three main things. First will be the co-isolation of nucleic acids from FFPE, some of the preliminary results that we've obtained through the genomic and epigenomic characterization of, of those analytes, and then wrap up with some conclusions and future plans. So in addition to serving uh, primarily as the uh, technical director of the molecular group at the BCR, uh, it's also my great pleasure to serve as a co-chair for the analysis working group uh, leading this effort. And so I wanted to start with this slide to um, give credit for all of the individuals who are contributing to this. It is truly a uh, classic TCGA approach to uh, new, new concept discovery. So before I again begin, I basically just wanted to uh, frame the context of this pilot and emphasize uh, or maybe just, just reiterate, as we all know, uh, that massively parallel sequencing has resulted in major advances in our understanding of tumor biology. Uh, many of the presentations that we've seen this morning, in fact, speak to that, where new drivers of cancer uh, tumor progression are being discovered, new therapeutic targets are identified, and even uh, molecular taxonomies for uh, cancer classification are being identified. I think it is important to note that many of these seminal studies have drawn from frozen biospecimens and the platforms that were used to generate those results were, were optimized for those frozen tissues. So it is the application of what is being learned through these research projects to the clinical environment that is commonly known as uh, precision medicine or as uh, Dr. Mongo referred to it, uh, uh, personalized medicine. And so that one of the challenges uh, in making that translation is that diagnostic specimens that are typically available are preserved as formal and fixed paraffin embedded samples. And it's fairly well known that that preservation method introduces uh, many molecular artifacts. So the goals for this FFP pilot were to first identify and optimize the best practices for the extraction, characterization, and analysis of FFP samples. And then our goal is to define the patterns of artifact introduced by that fixation process, and then hopefully in the end uh, contribute to bridging the gap uh, to this diagnostic material and facilitate the application of the emerging uh, cancer taxonomy to clinical testing environment. So from there, I will begin with um, our, our results from co-isolation of DNA and RNA from FFPE. So this pilot study actually started quite a while ago when the TCGA program office asked the BCR to identify a method of extracting DNA and RNA from FFPE tissue, uh, and they asked us to find an optimal method. <laughs> And so from the BCR's point of view, an optimal method is one that maximizes yield and integrity uh, with the hope that it um, provides consistent molecular characterization on the platforms outside of our domain. So uh, integrity uh, is measured at the BCR by DNA gel electrophoresis, and uh, what we would expect to see in an intact sample is a high molecular weight genomic band from DNA and from RNA, uh, high molecular weight discrete peaks for the ribosomal subunits on a RNA bioanalyzer trace. So in fact, this is what we see from uh, control tissues that we used in this pilot study where we procured uh, fresh tissue, split it in half, immediately froze one portion, and optimally paraffin embedded, formalin fixed and paraffin embedded the other half. It was that FFPE half that we then used to survey different commercially available uh, FFPE extraction methods. And so what we very quickly found was that there was no single off-the-shelf method that gave optimal DNA and RNA integrity. So as you can see here uh, from these FFP control tissues, we obtained nice DNA integrity, but the RNA was very much degraded. Uh, conversely, uh, we found other methods that didn't perform quite as well from a DNA integrity perspective, but the RNA integrity was, was much better. Uh, still not up to the standard of frozen, but from FFPE, this was perceived to be a pretty strong uh, signal. So from there, we undertook a task of uh, customizing the methods that were available commercially to try and improve the integrity of the DNA in the context of uh, improved RNA integrity. And what we ended up with in the end uh, is this TCGA optimized method where, as I mentioned, uh, DNA is maximally, um, the molecular weight of DNA is maximized and the molecular weight distribution of the RNA is also shifted to the trend of less de degraded RNA. Um, so here basically just briefly want to lay out what this method looks like, not dwell very much on it other than to say uh, this, this technique utilizes scrolls, not cores, and we normalize the input surface area for each extraction, not necessarily the number of scrolls that go in. And to point out that after um, 
the key point here is that the, the actual lysis step um, results in a supernatant that both the DNA and the RNA are, are further extracted from. So with this extraction method identified, then we turned our attention towards uh, patient samples. And there were uh, basically three criteria for inclusion in this pilot study. First was the, uh, the there needed to be uh, FFPE material available from a TCGA patient. Uh, and that TCGA patient needed to have previously qualified and shipped. And then lastly, uh, there needed to be enough residual analyte from those uh, frozen extractions from the previous shipment so that we could send out a, a uh, set of samples, a cohort that was frozen and FFPE pat, uh, matched patient samples. So after, um, some, uh, after a selection of patients, we ended up with uh, 38 patients in the study uh, distributed across six different tumor types, and there's quite a bit of information on the slide, but I think the only thing I really want to emphasize two things is that the average age of these tissue blocks was fairly uniform and just shy of three years old at the time of extraction, and that consistent with what we see from frozen extractions, uh, the DNA yield from FFPE is also less than RNA, and uh, use this point to illustrate the fact that it, it typically required more than one extraction to meet the yield requirements for dis distribution and characterization, so all of the data that we have is from, the, uh, from multiple pooled analytes uh, prior to shipment. So then if we talk about the distribution of this, uh, I'm summarizing here the five platforms that uh, paired tumor and FFPE analytes were sent to. Um, and when, when we distributed these, it was DNA and RNA from FFPE tumor, DNA and RNA from uh, frozen tumor, as well as a germline normal. And um, we sent them to as many places as we had yield to send. Uh, and there were uh, some that were rate limiting, and so that is uh, the explanation for the gap. So at this point, then, we can start to turn to the results. Uh, the first platform that I will show you today is the results from the SNP-6 array. And we were not very surprised, I would say, to find that the SNP-6 array did not perform very well uh, with FFP, or the FFP did not perform very well on the SNP-6 array. And in fact, uh, zero of the SNP-6 arrays passed the QC pipeline uh, in place at the Broad. And this was in large part due to the uh, highly seg over segmented copy number profile. And it's illustrated in this figure here where the fresh frozen samples are very tight, <coughs> excuse me, tight low segmentation, but the FFPE was hyper segmented and, and spread out. Uh, when put into a cluster analysis, um, FFPE was still able to validate copy number alterations in frozen. But if you did not have the frozen reference to map to, um, you found that a, there was a, um, high rate of false discovery. I guess when you, when you mapped it to the frozen, you found the FFP had far more copy number alterations, suggesting there was a high rate of uh, false discovery. And so the conclusion from this was that segmentation artifacts compromise the standalone utility for dis determining copy number alterations uh, of FFP through SNP-6 array. So the, ne the next platform then would be exome sequencing. And so I am showing you today results from one center and one of the studies. And shown here is a Lego plot that represents the rate of different types of single nucleotide transitions found in, in a tumor sample uh, relative to the germline control. And so essentially what you see on the z-axis is the rate of transitions per megabase. And this is essentially should be viewed as a profile of what the LUAD tumor type looks like in this view. And um, from our analysts, we heard that this, this picture is consistent with what was previously found through uh, the, the, the marker paper uh, for the LUAD study. Now, the interesting thing is when we, when we compare this picture from the frozen to the FFPE, we see a profound enrichment in C to T transitions uh, in the FFPE sample. And it's a little hard to see, but the scale here is actually doubled. And so the overall rate or distribution of other transitions is similar between frozen and FFPE. It is that we have a significant enrichment in the C to T. So to gain a little more information in, about those CDT transitions, we bend the, uh, the, the transitions by allele frequency, and we, we saw, interestingly, that the CDT artifact or CDT signature was really confined to the low allelic fraction compartment. So when we look at a low allelic compartment above 10%, we see now the profile of frozen to FFP is very similar. Uh, between the two is there a comparable sig signature, and then in this low allele fraction is where the C to T uh, artifact segregates. So these results support the use of FFPE for exome sequencing. However, the art uh, additional tools are needed to compensate for this artifact. 
So the next platform then uh, that I'll present is the mRNA sequencing results. And um, the, one of the methods that we use to evaluate the comparability of uh, RNA sequencing between frozen and FFPE samples was um, through this pairwise Pearson correlation. And essentially the, the takeaway message is there was fairly high correlation between uh, transcript abundance in the frozen and FFPE samples. Uh, the lowest average was a 0.85, and the point of reference here is a set of technical replicates run on the same platform um, at, U at UNC. So overall comparable, uh, when we do, an, uh, through another method of looking at this unsupervised clustering, we see that the dominant uh, clustering factor in the RNA-seq data is the tissue type. And then within that, we see that uh, patients for some of the studies segregate out um, together, suggesting that the effect of FFPE is very low in, the, in those studies, so uh, bladder and endometrial. However, in other studies, uh, such as uh, LUAD and colon rectal, we see that the effect of uh, preservation method is much more profound, suggesting that there may be some differences between the studies in the influence of uh, FFPE fixation. So if we wanted, we wanted to look a little bit more closely at that, so the next, um, the way that we did that was to isolate out only the significantly differentially regulated transcripts. And so this is a, a cluster analysis comparing the differences between fresh frozen and FFPE. And importantly, what we saw was in this cluster analysis, there was no dominant effect of tissue type in this. We see a reasonable distribution of tissues across, but we do see this, this fairly profound and somewhat scary if we are approaching a, a pilot to use FFPE uh, for, for um, precision medicine. There are some robust differences between, uh, between these transcripts. But I think the, the encouraging thing from this is when we drill down and look at the individual patients and then plot the relative transcript abundance of fresh frozen against its paired FFPE, we see a fairly linear relationship between the, the transcription um, levels or the transcription abundance, suggesting that there's a uniform o over or under detection within these specimens and it is not a transcript specific effect. So before I get run off the stage, then I'll go through the microRNA sequencing results very quickly and, and say uh, with, within this platform, we used a principal component, component analysis to evaluate the, uh, the effect of FFPE. And what we've found in this principal component analysis was that 70% of the variance uh, that could be detected in these samples is restricted to principal component one and that the effect of FFPE uh, through this analysis does not become apparent until principal component five, where you can begin to separate out the frozen versus the FFPE samples. So this suggests in the microRNA context, there's very weak contribution of uh, preservation method uh, on the outcome. And just briefly, one of the interesting things that we've, we've come across so far is that the, um, the number of microRNA that are significantly uh, regulated in FFPE, or at least significantly detected to be different in FFPE, uh, is far more diverse than what we find in frozen. So here are the microRNA contributing to cluster formation in frozen. Here are the microRNA contributing to cluster formation in FFPE. So we see greater diversity. Um, all microRNA up that are present here or present down here is highlighted in yellow. And then when we map the frozen to the FFPE, we see that frozen patient samples map to the similar cluster as the FFPE for the most part. So the orange and green, you see that very easily. But then uh, for, for other patient samples, there is some uh, straying from the original cluster. So overall, FFPE has a weak effect on microRNA characterization. However, there is quite a bit more work we need to do to look into the, um, the cause and effect of the increased microRNA diversity. And so, and then just, just lastly, um, I can very simply sum up the methylation platform. Um, we found very little effect of FFPE on methylation studies. And so if we just, just go right to the pairwise Pearson correlation coefficients, um, this, these are representative of what we see. And so with uh, DNA methylation, uh, there is very high concordance between frozen and FFPE tumor specimens, but we, we need to declare that this is um, very much dependent, of, or at least requires the Illumina FFPE restoration protocol, as that was best practice already in use when we ran this pilot study. So to, to close, um, I've shown you results on our optimization of nucleic acid co-isolation. Um, we've, we've found that DNA and RNA extracted from FFPE can be employed uh, for multiple state-of-the-art platforms. 
And then to, to just rehash the slides that I've kind of zipped through, SNP6 array had a high false discovery rate. Uh, exomes were interpretable with artifact caveats. Methylation worked very well, assuming you're using this Illumina FFP restoration protocol. Um, mRNA-seq, there was very good correlation between FFPE and frozen samples. However, there is some differential uh, detection of transcripts that needs to be um, evaluated further, and also that this platform utilized the ribose zero chemistry. Um, and then lastly, the mRNA-seq, systematic increase in the diversity of microRNA species from FFPE. So in conclusion, with 18 seconds blinking red, um, <laughs> we uh, intend to um, further this work by analyzing the signature of FFPE through multi-center calling, and that work is underway right now, and we, we think that will um, enhance the robustness of our ability to characterize this effect. Um, we're also working to delineate the influence of tumor heterogeneity in this comparison that we are performing. So again, this is frozen specimen compared to FFPE from different areas of the tumor. And um, literally before I walked up here, I received the, the Lego plots from, from that heterogeneity analysis, specifically looking for CDT artifact in our LUAD samples in the frozen adjacent portions, and we do not see that artifact, suggesting that, that the results that I've shown today are, are more likely to be attributed to the effect of FFPE than a spatial heterogeneity difference. Uh, and then finally, um, we are intend to do deeper analysis of the differences between um, these two preservation methods so that we may identify uh, bioinformatic mechanisms to correct for these artifacts. Um, I think that's it. I'm happy to take any questions. And before, before time interest, let us give the question for this. So if you have a question, we can discuss later, yeah. So, um, so as you know, the PS3K kinase is one of the most muted genes across all different cancer types. So our next speaker is Chris uh, Benz from Buck Institute for Research on Aging. He will talk about the domain-specific PS3K mutation affects different pathway activity across uh, more than 3,000 pan cancer tumors. Thank you.